First of all, my mum's going to see this, so I have to say hello, mum. And uh, I, I must have hacked 10x to get here. Uh, what a great opportunity. Thank you. Um, we live in a world today where minute by minute, unsustainable processes are destroying our shared home, Earth. Where 85 people on this planet have the same wealth as three and a half of billion of our poorest people on this planet. And rampant poverty is continuing like never before in history. We are lucky tonight to be able to go home and flick on a switch and light will shine, turn on a tap and water will pour and plug into a device and connect to the internet where most of mankind's knowledge has been amassed. This is because an entrepreneur somewhere had a vision, created an effective system at a competitive price where, where users have purchased that technology. What is an entrepreneur if not a problem solver? And I believe entrepreneurs have been and will always continue to be the very people who solve the problems that I mentioned just a minute ago. Today I'm hoping to share with you insight along an entrepreneur's journey and understand, I'm hoping to persuade you the importance of an entrepreneur's journey, not to be blinded by the glorious highs, but also to be aware of some of the disastrous lows. I think it's really important in society that we understand this process. And hopefully I'm gonna share with you some of my stories that will give you an insight into some of the parts of the journey that are not normally spoken about. So, I'd like to start with an analogy of trying to understand an entrepreneur. It's an analogy of a baby. Imagine your child was trying to learn how to walk and fell over and somebody came across to you and said, your child will never be able to walk. How would you respond? Entrepreneurs being the biggest babies, because they're doing things that have normally not been done before and typically lack the parental equivalent of guidance. The toughest decision I ever made was to tell my mother, who will be watching this, she likes to be called mother, I call her ma, but um, that I was going to quit my university degree. It took me 18 months to build up the courage and the inspiration was a story that's happened throughout history where commanders have gone across the seas with their army to try and invade a land, and they've made one big key decision, to burn the boats so there is no other mental way of escaping, either to succeed or fail. Now, I knew this would not be a healthy decision at, at parts of my journey, but I literally didn't have any other option but to get to where I am today, thank goodness, not that I expected to be here uh, at this stage of my career. And you can imagine how happy my mum was when two weeks later when I told her I was having a gap year, which she completely seen through that nonsense of lies. When she found out that I'd borrowed money off my friends and taken out credit cards and used my life savings to buy cameras, ink, basically setting up a photography business in nightclubs, selling key rings to drunk people. <laughs> now, entrepreneurs typically do too many things at once, so I had another idea while I was doing that business, and I, said, I thought it would be good to integrate technology into construction sites from a security perspective. This was a complete disaster. I couldn't get anybody to work for me. Um, I don't look too much of a security figure, I hope. And, um, I had to work on a building site to save the contract seven nights a week, six at night till six in the morning. And after a few hours sleep, I'd wake up and I was expanding the photography business, which ended up in 10 cities and I had 50 part-time staff. So at the age of 20, I was earning thousands of pounds a week. I was having a great education in terms of how to run businesses. And this was certainly one of my highs. I then had an idea for a mobile application, and I reached out to the most credible person I knew in my network. I, I'm very proud to say after all we've been through is still my business partner, uh, Sean Gibson, in 2008. And 
We basically risked everything we possibly had, our businesses, any kind of credit we could get our hands on. We had loved ones, families and friends taking out bank loans, telling their bank manager they were having a home improvement, they were getting a new kitchen, and they were giving us 15, 20, 30,000 pounds at a time. We built this piece of technology in Sydney in Australia, similar to the time where Facebook was entering the UK market, and we completely mis-executed. Before I tell you about that, I remember being in Sydney by the pool. I was buying tailored suits, thinking I was a real you know, flashy guy. I'm clearly not. And uh, apartment's gone, girlfriend's gone, back on my mum's couch. And I want, I want to share this moment with you. I was, I was definitely comfort eating. Um, and... <laughs> I cannot tell you how much of a social leper I felt. My friends thought I was a loser. My family told me to give up dreaming, stop having grandiose thoughts that I'm going to create a business. And I, I just, I was depressed. I ended up on, on the state welfare, on the dole. And I remember being, waiting for my welfare check. And to the side of me was a gentleman, God bless him, that was off his face on drugs and there was nearly a fight breaking out in the room, and I thought, I don't belong here. You know, I, I, I'm not a bad person. I didn't, I didn't mean to me mess up. I just made a big mistake. And every day I think, how am I going to pay my loved ones back? It wasn't bank loans that I could just write off. And I made the biggest decision in my life which was I, I told myself I was going to teach myself, I taught myself how to code. I spent a year locked away pretty much in a bedroom. And again, you can imagine all that 12-month period, what my friends and family thought, especially when I was telling my mom, I'm doing the same education as kids from Harvard in a bedroom in Salford. She thought I'd lost my mind. And that's, that's the tough bit. When your loved ones start to question your sanity, that's when you really think, am I crazy? Should I, why, 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 why am I resisting a career path like 99% of other people? That's a bit of an exaggeration, but you'll forgive me. And through that pro process, I was, I was watching copious amounts of YouTube videos and Vimeo videos and obviously some great TED Talks. And um, I, was, I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was inspired to think differently. My idols, such as Steve Jobs, taught me many things, but one in particular was to be mindful that I'm going to die. Now, that sounds like quite a morbid message for people who haven't heard it for the first time, but if you think about it, how lucky you are to have your loved ones in your life, to be alive, to be able to have the opportunity to do what you want to do, and I ask the question, why do I want to do what I want to do? What is it? I came to the conclusion that I want to have as much social impact in the world as I possibly can before I die. Hopefully that's not going to be later on this afternoon. Um, why, why, why did I even think like that? I guess the, the easiest way for me to explain to you is, having had money and lost money, I realized that my wealth was my loved ones. It was, it was the close relationships I still had in my life. And it was the fact that I still, after having such a big failure, still had the opportunity to create the future that I so, so desperately wanted to create. And I realized that listening to, listening to the Bill and Melissa Gates Foundation about not getting rich and giving back at the end of your career, but a, taking a new approach and giving along your career can make you really happy. And I'm sure if there's anybody here who's volunteered or... Uh, give, 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 donated to charity, the feeling of giving is exceptional. It's what makes me happiest. But I also selfishly want the best for my family. You know, one day if I'm lucky enough to have a family, you know, I want the best future for them too. I also was inspired to take a longer term view. Everybody's rushing. You see people rushing to work. You know, I've got to go here, got to go there. Uh, I need to do it next week, next month, six months, this year, you know, New Year's Eve. This year's going to be my year. 
Well, listen to idols such as Jess Bezos at Amazon and Phil Libin of Evernote and people like Brad Feld who created something called the Boulder Thesis. And I realized that to achieve my level of ambition, to have the biggest social impact I possibly can, I need to take a longer term view. So I'm going to tell you what I did next when I was uh, called a fat geek on a couch and depressed and all the rest of it. But I want to ask this audience, how many people would have believed that I would have done anything in that position? I really felt isolated from society. I didn't want to go out. I just wanted to fix the problem. So, I then realized my approach, my how, how I wanted to do things about giving as giving to as many people as I possibly can while not compromising my business. And I stumbled across a problem. I thought, where to be based? Now, one of the, the most famous and successful investors in history, Warren Buffett, who is absolutely one of my idols, was not based on Wall Street. And his reason for that was cost savings and competition for talent, but more importantly than any of that, what an Excel spreadsheet or a big business can't can't quantify is the power of being happy. I love Manchester. I was born and raised here. This is one of the most entrepreneurial cities on this planet. Home of the Industrial Revolution, we split the atom. The first programmable computer was here. The father of computer science chose to be based in Manchester. And recently, as you found today, we discovered graphene among many other accolades. Manchester is a city that is two hours away from London on train, that chooses to live here and not to move to London. We are the city that dares to think differently, and I think that's the most conducive environment to be around for starting a business, to be around follow, fellow crazy people. And I am very lucky to be privy to the plans that are gonna happen in our great city. And please, I want you to keep, keep following what's happening because Manchester will become a top five European startup destination. So I chose to stay in Manchester, but I needed to justify that because I would be based anywhere in the world. I'd be based on the moon if I had to be. If wherever is best for my business, I'd always come back because I'm proudly British. So I asked the question, where was the best place to be based? And I did a research project by accident I, I just looked at what was going on across the country and started to realize some of the great brains that we've got in Britain and some of the great su success stories that the public are not yet aware of and just thought, this is crazy. This should be on a map. So Sean and I, we hacked together the first prototype of techbritain.com and we took the crazy decision, or should I say, probably I'm the crazy guy and he's the reason why things actually happen. Um, I took the crazy decision that we were going to travel around the country interviewing recommended members of the tech community. So with no money, one of my close friends, God bless him, trusted me enough to go and buy me a camera and lighting equipment, looking at me like, this is your last chance, mate. I can't believe you after this. And we went on a mega bus and couch surfed. If anybody hasn't come across couch surfing, that's strangers letting you sleep on their couch for free. Crazy, right? Beautiful. Only once you've had the experience will you understand what I'm talking about. And on, through that, I traveled to Dundee, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Belfast, Newry, Derry, Newcastle, Birmingham, Cardiff, Exeter, Bristol, Bath, London, Hull, uh, Manchester as well. I normally always get it right, but I'm allowed to mess up on stage. Um, and we interviewed computer science professors, meetups, hackathons, big event organizers, the startups from small to Google, the journalists, the venture capitalists, and put it all on a map. But one of the stories I wanted to share in this journey was the first couch surfing guest in Edinburgh. It was a lovely Polish couple, and the gentleman, Nico Dem, allowed us to stay there for a few nights, and he's an entrepreneur himself. And what we didn't realize at the time was he lived five miles outside from Edinburgh, and we couldn't even afford a bus, bus ticket. So Sean and I would walk five miles in the morning with our 
lighting equipment and photography equipment, try and freshen up as best as we could and interview really credible people, and then we'd walk back five miles. People don't get to hear these kind of stories, but it was horrible. My, my legs were aching when we did that after three days, and I really would not have had the mental strength or the physical strength to have done the tour and done what I've done today without really knowing why I was doing things. That's what kept me going. You all have all heard the, you know, Winston Churchill say, never give up. But I think what was implied there and needs to be highlighted is why. Why you're doing what you're doing. I knew what I was doing. I knew why I was doing it. And that's what kept me going. So on the third day of doing this walking backwards and forwards, the rain came down and we were soaked. And Nico Dem said to us at his door, quite rightly, strangers that are living on his couch, why are you so wet? You look like you've been swimming. The bus stop is 100 yards away. So we told him the truth, that we couldn't afford a bus journey. And he said, where are you going next? How are you going to get across the country? And we said, we don't know, but we're going to find a way. So you can imagine how happy he was and what a lovely experience it was when he seen us with pictures of having meetings at Downing Street and presenting last year at Buckingham Palace and receiving the support of the Duke of York. It was, it was really, really beautiful to share that journey and experience with him. But it, really, it was leaning on the fact he was an entrepreneur to even uh, not kick us out the house for saying such crazy talk. The next thing was I wanted to be around like-minded people. I wanted to set up an office in Manchester and... In 2012, in November, I watched a TEDx talk by Martin Bryant, who, if anybody doesn't know, is a world-class tech journalist, possibly one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world. You owe me for that, Martin. And, um, and I sent him this terribly verbose email saying, I've had this failure, I'm going to do this tour of Tech Britain, and then I'm going to open up this office in Manchester. Please, would you give me some advice? Because he, his TEDx talk was asking, where are the startups, the technology businesses in Manchester? Not only did he give me advice, he met me, and he made two key introductions along the tour of Tech Britain. And one of the things that I want to share with you is how if you ask people in positions of power for help, it's really surprising how willing people are because they've been in the same position as you were once. And many people don't do that. And I really urge anybody out there who wants to do something, to ask people in more senior positions for help. So here's a picture of my family. Um, we, they, they came to the opening party for the evening, and um, this was, <laughs> I think this was as therapeutic for them as it was for me, having seen me locked away in a bedroom for so long, to see that uh, there was something tangible. They, they have no idea what I do, but it was just good for them to see that we have... Uh, at, We've got um, some good, we've got our main sponsors, Barclays Bank, and they're like, well, if a bank's giving you money, you're doing something right. This is good. <laughs> this is better than the doll. Um, and uh, the gentleman on the second, second to right is, um, is or was, is very lucky to have two fathers in this lifetime. And uh, unfortunately, he, he passed away last year, and I remember him saying to me, well, when are you going to make me proud? You know, you've quit your law degree. Come on, Doug. You know, I've supported you the whole way. When are you going to make me proud? And uh, last year, when just before before he passed away in the hospital, um, I was lucky enough to show him the picture that I'm going to show you at the end. So that was, that was a really beautiful thing. And I think what I'm trying to get across here is, for entrepreneurs, it's difficult to have relationships. I haven't spent as much time with my family and friends as I should have. And relationships with girlfriends has always been difficult because as an entrepreneur, you're conflicted. You're so passionate about your mission that sometimes you, you, like, you find it difficult to keep in touch with those you love. And I, I, I am stood here on the stage, but I'm very blessed on my business partners, Sean Gibson and Tom Seddon, who are far brighter than I'll ever be. And they were fully committed with what we're doing. And I want to dispel, what I'm trying to say is, I want to dispel the myth that it's about me. It's not about me. It's about we. 
Now, that might sound a little bit cheesy, but I need you to understand it isn't the entrepreneur that you read about that is the key to the success. It's the team around the entrepreneur, the people who are crazy enough to let me drive the vision and to steer the ship. I, I need to say thank you to the computer science professor at Harvard University who took the decision to put his courses online for free, Mr. David Mallon. And I want to talk about growing up as an entrepreneur that in, in, the, in the respect of relationships, last year I, um, I, I fell in love and uh, I was completely unprepared for it. Uh, I mean, imagine falling off a cliff type, unprepared for it. And um, what this amazing woman did for me was she, she changed my why. It suddenly became about me and somebody else, which is incredibly difficult for an entrepreneur when you're so independent. And I started to realize how happy it would make me to have a partner, because from the support network, she made me feel less isolated from society, and she did the most beautiful thing for me. She made me realize that I'm just the same as everybody else. I just want to be loved, and I just want to be happy. So I want to thank, I want to thank that lady. And, you know, the, the idea of negotiating a contract until death still scares the hell out of me. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know if we're going to make it, but... Um, I'm incredibly grateful for having met and had the experience of meeting this, this special person to me. Um, I think it's important for you to ask other entrepreneurs when you come across them to see it's not just me. Many entrepreneurs have got, will share their stories of ups and downs. And they may come across crazy to you at some time, but I want, I want to put it to us as a society that we don't attack a child when it falls over. This whole room wouldn't come against a child when it's unbalanced on a bike learning how to cycle. So why do some of the most important people in society have to go through a horrible ridicule process and, and have bad social stigma when they're going through the necessary learning experience of their journey. I want to ask this audience, next time you meet an entrepreneur that's going along his journey, whether he's down or he's trying to do something, to give him the same respect as an entrepreneur that's experiencing a glorious high. Because these two people are both of the same journey. And it's for entrepreneurs who have taken the frightening commitment and arduous task to push mankind out of the dark ages and into an unimaginably bright future that we should cherish them all at any stage of their journey. I'm simply Doug1987 on Twitter and Hacker News. If I ever can help you, I will. In a world of information overload, with more content being digested and put online than you can consume in a lifetime in one day, I wish to distill the world's information and make your lives more time efficient. Thank you. <laughs>